Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about alcohol abuse and withdrawal, which is, I think, a very pertinent subject related to our patient population here in Albuquerque. We definitely have an alcohol abuse problem in our city, in our county, and in our state. In fact, if you look at some statistics from the New Mexico Department of Health, our rates for death that are attributed to alcohol are almost double the national average. And if you look at the end of the graph there towards the last four or five years, those numbers have increased a lot and continue to climb, which is unfortunate. Here's a look at different counties that struggle with alcohol abuse and alcohol-related death. Bernalillo County is there in the middle. You can see we're about average for the state, but we're still well above the national average for death rates in a population adjusted for 100,000. And here's another look at chronic disease death that's also related to alcohol use and abuse. You can see mostly concentrated in the Four Corners region, but Bernalillo County is right there in the middle. The little boot-shaped county right here is also included in that. So we absolutely have an alcohol problem. It looks, based on the Department of Health statistics, like it starts at an early age. Surveys of high schoolers in the state look like binge drinking, first alcohol use, marijuana use, and other drug use is also higher than the national average in the United States as a whole. Not surprisingly, related with our alcohol use and abuse and death rates is also chronic liver disease, which again continues to climb and is well above the national average. If you break it out by patient population and race and ethnicity, again, these are from the New Mexico Department of Health, but it tends to affect the Native American population exponentially more than the rest of the other ethnicities in our state. So it's no surprise that we have a problem. We deal with this every day. We see it every day. What is the actual definition of alcohol abuse? Well, technically, for a female, that would be seven drinks a week, which is one a day, or three or more drinks on one occasion. Whereas for males, it would be 14 drinks per week, or about two per day, with four or more drinks per occasion would also define abuse for females and males. Now, what defines a drink? Great question. It depends what kind of alcohol you're talking about. So a drink, so if you're thinking about a female, which would be one per day, it would be one beer, eight ounces of malt liquor, one glass of wine, or one shot of alcohol would constitute one drink. There's some screening questions that we like to ask patients in the hospital. I mean, you can absolutely ask them to your patients in the field if you're interested in digging a little deeper into their alcohol use or abuse. But the easy way to remember it is CAGE. We call it the CAGE questionnaire. And it's a little acronym for kind of doing some introspection into people's drinking habits. The first question is, have you ever felt you should cut down on your drinking? Next is, do you get annoyed when people ask you about your drinking? The G stands for feeling guilty about drinking. And E is if you've ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady nerves or to get rid of a hangover, and that's known as an eye-opener. So just asking those four simple questions, if the answer is yes to any of those, it can lead to some more introspection and maybe some help-seeking for um, the beginnings or the middle of alcohol abuse to try to catch it before it becomes a problem. It's important for us to realize as we're dealing with our patients who struggle with alcohol dependence, this is absolutely a disease. A lot of times by the point we, we get to them, their brain is dependent on that substance to keep it functioning and to keep them healthy. People die from alcohol withdrawal. So it's absolutely a disease. We need to treat them not as if this is a choice. Maybe at one point it was a choice when they started, but a lot of times we get to people when their body is absolutely dependent on this substance, and we need to treat them like we would anybody with diabetes or heart failure or any other disease process where their body is struggling to keep itself going. And here's a little bit of the pathophysiology of why the body and the brain specifically becomes dependent on alcohol. Alcohol as a molecule, it binds to the GABA receptor in the brain, which is an inhibitory receptor, meaning that it slows everything down. So that's why when people get intoxicated, they have kind of sluggish movement, they have slurred speech, they have slower reaction times. It is a medication functionally 
that just depresses everything and calms everything down. That's why people tend to drink when maybe they're feeling anxious. It's, it's essentially an over-the-counter drug to help with anxiety and counteract feelings of hyperactivity. Now, when alcohol binds to the receptor, the way it functionally works is it actually binds the same kind of GABA receptor where benzodiazepines, the drugs we give, what to do what? Calm people down, right? Same thing with barbiturates and some other drugs that we give in the medical realm. It opens the receptor and causes chloride to flood into the intracellular space and then cause some other intracellular cascades. But it's important to realize here that alcohol binds in the same in the same receptor that benzodiazepines and barbiturates do. So if you look a little bit closer at the way the GABA receptors work, if you look at this picture over here on the left, the receptor without alcohol, where there's just a simple normal GABA neurotransmitter that's binding, this substance is in people's brains naturally. It will cause chlorine to flood in. It'll cause a little bit of calming effect or sluggishness or whatever inhibition is needed at the time by the brain, it'll do that on its own. But when you add alcohol to the native GABA neurotransmitter, chlorine just floods through that channel and you get massive suppression and inhibition. So it potentiates the receptor to let more chlorine in and help accentuate the effects of that receptor. Now what happens over time if you just have your normal GABA receptor with your normal GABA neurotransmitters that are naturally in your brain, you get a little bit of chloride that are kind of keeping the balance between inhibition and excitation, right? The body's all about balance. If you add a little bit of alcohol with your GABA receptor, you're going to get that massive flood of chlorine through the receptor and you're going to get very much enhanced sedation and inhibition, right? But over time, is that receptor, if you have someone who's chronically drinking alcohol, the receptor can't stay that busy all the time and it starts to not recognize alcohol as such a potent stimulator anymore. So even though in your chronic alcoholics, you might have some native GABA function and you'll have alcohol present, over time that receptor becomes less sensitive to the alcohol and doesn't cause as much inhibition as before. That's why we, I say working in the emergency room, we've got some world-class drinkers in this state. I've seen people come into the emergency room walking and talking with blood alcohol levels of 450. And that's how they can do that is because over time that receptor becomes less and less sensitive to that amount of alcohol and um, stops being as inhibitory as it would in say a person who's naive to alcohol where the, the receptor would be overly stimulated. So it's all about balance, right? So the, the hormone that balances out GABA is glutamate. So if GABA is your inhibitory neurotransmitter, glutamate is your excitatory neurotransmitter, and they balance each other out. And if you look at the receptor where glutamate binds, it binds to a receptor called the NMDA receptor. And I'm not going to tell you what that means because I can't pronounce it. As long as you know NMDA, you're fine. But if you notice here at this receptor, remember how in the GABA receptor there was benzodiazepines and barbiturates that bind on that receptor to cause the sedation and the inhibition? If you look at glutamate, look what else binds here. PCP, ketamine, most of our stimulant drugs that we either take or prescribe are going to potentiate this receptor. So all your excitatory drugs like PCP, PCP causes a lot of hallucinations. Ketamine can cause some agitations too at different doses. And then glutamate does the same thing. And glutamate is the balance to GABA. So if you look at this, the easiest way for me to picture it is on a scale. And our body loves to be in equilibrium, right? So you want to have a balance between inhibition, which is GABA, and you want to have that balanced out by excitation, which is glutamate. And normally, in a brain without alcohol, these will evenly balance each other out, and the brain will do this by itself. Now, what happens when you have a brain that's adapted to alcohol is that you have a little bit of GABA, you add some ethanol on here, or alcohol, and glutamate 
in order to keep that balance over time has to become overstimulated, right? Your body starts to make more glutamate in order to balance out that ethanol. Our body does its best to always maintain balance. So if you look at the NMDA receptor site in a patient who's addicted to alcohol, here's a normal. If you start on the left, this is just a normal NMDA that's binding to glutamate. You need some excitation. So the glutamate binds, it opens the receptor, calcium floods in, and the body becomes a little more stimulated, right? If you add alcohol to the NMDA receptor, alcohol has a little bit of effects on the NMDA receptor as well. So it is, it'll actually open that channel. But over time, if you have an alcohol dependent patient, NMDA is going to become massively more sensitive trying to balance out the inhibitory effects of alcohol. So if you think about that last slide on the GABA receptor, your GABA receptor is going to be less responsive to alcohol binding, whereas your excitatory neurotransmitters are going to be more easy to stimulate in the setting of chronic alcohol. So this is what it looks like on our balance beam. So if you have a brain that's used to having alcohol around, remember we have a lot of alcohol, we have a little bit of GABA, right? But glutamate is having to really work a lot harder to balance all the alcohol that's present. Well, what happens when you have a patient who suddenly decides to quit drinking is that GABA receptor doesn't just get better overnight. And so it's still harder to stimulate there's not as much GABA around because the brain is kind of dependent on that alcohol to be there. And then that glutamate receptor, which is in fifth gear, is now working overtime and you get someone who is incredibly hyperstimulated. And that's what, exactly what happens in alcohol withdrawal. And this is why it can be deadly. So it can absolutely kill people. Early signs are going to be agitation, anxiety, Patients, if it progresses without any treatment, they can become delirious and then have seizures. And that's getting into the dangerous part called delirium tremens where people can die. So if you think about what's happening in the brain, what you see when people are withdrawing starts to make sense. So you have overstimulation of your excitatory neurotransmitters and you're going to see patients with very high blood pressures, very high heart rates. They're going to be anxious. They're going to be shaky. They're going to be agitated and they're going to be sweaty. This is what their brain is telling their body to do because their receptors have changed over time and there's the balance has been taken away. And if not treated or recognized, that can progress to delirium tremens, which is absolutely a life-threatening emergency. And it's actually got a pretty high mortality if it's not recognized and treated. So delirium tremens begins when you have a patient who's confused. They might be having seizures. They may start to hallucinate. Usually it's visual hallucinations. There's something called formication, which is kind of a funny word, but it really just means that people start to feel things on their skin. And typically this is described as like feeling like there's bugs or things crawling. And sometimes they'll really try to convince you that they see things on their skin and they'll try to get you to see them too. And that's part of the hallucination that goes with this. But they're going to autonomic hyperreactivity. We already talked about the blood pressures, the heart rates, the diaphoresis. They'll be sweaty. A lot of times they'll have fever. This is absolutely a medical emergency and needs to be recognized um, by us because we actually do see a lot of patients who are withdrawing. Now, I think this is a pretty helpful slide because this is a timeline. One of the most important questions we can ask our alcoholic patients is, when was your last drink? And that kind of can help you frame what you're seeing in their vital signs and in their presentation. So typically, and again, I always like to say, patients don't read the textbook. So you always need to evaluate what you know in the context of your patient and allow some wiggle room. But on average, stage one withdrawal is gonna start in the first eight hours. And that's where your patient's gonna feel anxious, they might have some trouble sleeping, um, might have different aches and pains throughout their body as their body is starting to miss the presence of alcohol and that glutamate receptor is starting to get ramped up. Now over the next couple of days is where it gets dangerous and that's where you start to see the vital sign abnormalities, uh, maybe the fever, 
and then day two or day three so 48 to 72 hours after the last drink will typically be, be when you start to see the delirium tremens so the hallucinations the seizures the extreme agitation the altered mental status and then over the course of the next week if that doesn't kill them then things will start to taper off as the body starts to re restore a normal balance but just remember like i said we have some world-class drinkers in this city and i've seen people in the ed start to withdraw in a little less than eight hours actually and it's funny because we'll have people come in like i said walking and talking with a blood alcohol level of 450 and even if their blood alcohol level gets down to 200 sometimes i've seen them start to go into withdrawal with a blood level that's still above the legal limit so just take everything in the context of your patient and remember that vital signs are vital and treat the patient that's in front of you not the numbers that you see in the textbook so how do we treat withdrawal? Well, if you remember the GABA receptor where alcohol is acting, that's also the same receptor where benzodiazepines work. So that's how we treat it. We just help restore that balance until the body can do it itself. So in a acute withdrawal syndrome, we have glutamate that's overactive and is tipping the scales in the favor of excitation. And to restore that equilibrium, we're gonna give benzodiazepine or in our case, it'll be Versed. So you just, are essentially stimulating the GABA receptor to bring bring the balance back to where it should be and get that patient out of the dangerous realm. Here's just another uh, look at the receptor and how it works. Here's the GABA receptor, alcohol binds here, benzodiazepines bind over here. Functionally, they have the exact same outcome where they are increasing inhibitory signals to slow everything down. All right, so that's enough pathophysiology for today, but I really want everybody to understand the consequences of alcohol abuse. I think it is a much bigger problem than people realize, and I'd be a bad doctor if I didn't go through all of this with you guys too. So, and think about it in the context of your patients. It has a whole cascade of events, not just on the brain, but throughout the entire body. And if you look at alcohol abuse effects on the liver and specifically on the gut, in the liver, it's really going to affect utilization of nutrients, it's gonna affect metabolism of things that are eaten, and it's gonna decrease transport of nutrients. And oh, by the way, this whole time, it's making the liver's job exponentially harder to metabolize things and pull out the good and turn the bad into waste. The gut is having a harder time absorbing any nutrients. So as alcohol is chronically in the body, the gut is not able to do its job of absorption and the liver is not able to do its job as well of metabolism. And those two things together can lead to some pretty profound malnutrition. One of the things that you might see out there on the streets is vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin and a liver plays an important role here. Some of the physical manifestations you can look for in your patients, and I've seen this before here, um, hyperkeratosis, so you get kind of this scaly skin with vitamin A deficiency, kind of almost like reptile-like, these bumps, and they're not necessarily itchy, and they don't look inflamed, they're just raised. And then vitamin A specifically affects the eyes, and sometimes you can see these like little white plaques on the white part of the eyes called bateau spots, and another evidence of vitamin A deficiency would be blindness at night, which I wouldn't be surprised if it, that explains some of our pedestrians that are constantly getting hit by cars if they're wandering into the street at night and they can't see that well um, because of some malnourishment issues. It wouldn't shock me at all. Also with vitamin A deficiency, um, you can see some of the other signs of chronic alcohol abuse, which would be insomnia, fatigue, immune suppression. Immune suppression will be a common theme with all mountain malnutritious uh, diseases. Vitamin C is another very important thing to think about in patients who chronically use alcohol. You might see easy bruising and bleeding, impaired wound healing, capillary ruptures in the feet. I'm sure you've seen these kind of little petechiae on people's ankles before. And then just in and of itself, vitamin C can, if there's a deficiency, can cause joint pain and swelling. The reason for that is that vitamin C is a critical piece of collagen formation, and it's really important for formation and integrity of blood vessels and bones. And so 
if the patient is deficient in vitamin C due to malnourishment from chronic alcohol abuse, you can see places where they might easily bleed would be the smaller capillaries, the joints, and the gums. Another problem with chronic alcohol abuse is electrolyte deficiencies, um, and these can absolutely cause sudden cardiac death. We know that alcoholics have a higher risk of sudden cardiac death in the general population, and part of that is due to specifically three electrolytes that are important in cardiac conduction and um, cellular function, most importantly being potassium. As potassium stores get low and due to malnutrition and alcohol abuse, the uh, cardiac conduction will be affected and can lead to spontaneous dysrhythmias. Magnesium and phosphate also play an important role here. Most of our alcoholics are chronically anemic. Um, this is due to a folate deficiency and the way that folate plays into anemia is that if you take your, your red blood cell precursors, it makes it really hard if you don't have folate present for the cells to divide and to continue to multiply. And most red blood cells only last about 120 days. And if you have a shorter chain of supply due to folate deficiency, what happens is you get old floppy red blood cells that aren't as efficient as car at carrying oxygen and it can lead to sometimes pretty profound anemia. So folate is essential for red blood cell function, but not just for red blood cells. It's really critical for any kind of DNA synthesis, and so that can also lead to protein deficiencies. And in your immune system, your main immune mediators are proteins, and if you don't have enough folate to stimulate your DNA synthesis, you're going to be profoundly immune suppressed as well. Another problem with alcohol is gastritis and peptic ulcers. So it's very, very hard on the lining of the stomach. And usually the stomach over here on the left is a, a nice, healthy kind of mucus barrier in the stomach to help with digestion and keep that acid that's in the stomach. Usually in the stomach, the pH is about 2.0, which is very acidic. But there's a mucus lining there that protects the stomach from getting eaten away from the acid that it's producing. Well, in alcoholics, the mucus barrier gets worn away, and then the acid that's present in the stomach can cause an ulcer and gastritis and can cause some pretty terrible abdominal pain. And sometimes if it's bad enough, the ulcer can perforate the stomach, which can be a life-threatening surgical emergency. And not only that, but it can cause bleeding, too. Alcohol is not the only thing that causes gastritis. This is the same process that chronic NSAID use will, u will cause, as well as chronic steroid use. So we, I tend to ask patients where I suspect gastritis. I, I ask them three questions, how much alcohol they drink, if they're taking steroids, and how much ibuprofen or NSAIDs they're taking, because those are the three biggest culprits for stomach irritation and ulcers. The problem with gastritis is that it can lead to massive bleeding and further worsen the malabsorption that's going on in the gut. Everyone knows that alcohol is tough on the liver. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. One is that it causes direct cell death, but not only by directly killing the cells in the liver that are trying to metabolize everything, it also causes a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress. And so it makes a lot of toxic byproducts. So not only are cells dying, but there's toxic byproducts that make the liver even, make it even more difficult for the liver to do its job. And in the meantime, as a byproduct, more and more fatty acid is being produced based on the biochemical pathways. So overall, we all know it's bad for the liver and there's a couple different reasons why. This is the road to liver failure. So if you start with a normal liver, as you increase alcohol use, steatosis is just a f fancy name for fatty liver alcohol when it's metabolized is turned into fatty acids and those fatty acids are stored in the liver for more energy so you get fatty liver first and then the liver becomes so fat that it becomes inflamed and big and a little bit more angry with all kinds of cells that are trying to heal the dead and dying cells from the directly toxic effects of the alcohol and as the inflammatory cells come into the liver and try to heal the cells that are dying Part of the healing process, we all know, is scar formation, right? So the liver literally starts to scar down because of all the inflammation that's been going on over time, and it becomes smaller and it becomes harder. 
and it becomes less able to do its job, the blood flow, about 30% of our blood flow goes through our liver every minute. And as that becomes more like a rock and less like a sponge, it's hard to get fluid through there to be metabolized. And the liver gets harder and harder, and then the cells start to change their shape and their function, and that's what leads to liver cancer. So that's the cycle of liver failure and alcohol abuse and why that happens. Another consequence of chronic alcohol use is ketoacidosis. So when alcohol is metabolized, the first metabolite that it makes is called acetate. And there is a certain enzyme that's needed to turn alcohol into acetate, and that is called NADH. And as your body makes more NADH, it's hard to process H. Hydrogen is an acid, so you have more acid building up in your blood, and the way that our body processes that is to turn it into ketones. Well, ketones are also an acid that needs to be metabolized by the body, and that can cause a profound metabolic acidosis. Not only that, but the problem with having too much NADH and too much acid in our body is that it prohibits the liver from making sugar stores, right? Sugar is kind of the fuel for our body, and normally the liver stores that for times of need. But because there's too much of this NADH, it makes it hard for the liver to store glucose. And so you can have chronic alcoholics who tend to be hypoglycemic because their liver is just not able to do the things that it normally does. And not only that, but in your alcoholics, they're typically not eating a good diet, so they don't, they're not getting good carbohydrates through their diet to start with. All right, one other consequence of chronic alcohol use is pancreatitis. Um, this tends to present with epigastric pain with patients who are complaining of nausea and profound vomiting. Sometimes this can follow binge drinking. Sometimes patients will be able to tell you that they've had pancreatitis in the past. The reason patients get pancreatitis in relation to alcohol, there's a couple other reasons patients get pancreatitis too, but in relation to alcohol, it's kind of the same thing as what's going on in the liver. Just like alcohol kills liver cells, alcohol kills pancreas cells as well. So there's directly toxic effects to the cells in the pancreas. And over time, that causes inflammation and scarring, which obstructs the ducts that are trying to transport hormones and digestive enzymes, and it can't do its job. And the problem with pancreatitis is your pancreas is full of digestive enzymes. And what happens if they get blocked in there, but your body's still telling your pancreas to secrete them, is you can actually, your pancreas will digest itself. And it's incredibly painful because these are pretty highly metabolically active enzymes and it cause, it does cause a lot of pain and then it causes more scarring and then leads to bigger problems. So this is a very real entity for our alcoholics and it's very painful. Another consequence of binge drinking is referred to as holiday heart syndrome. This is a very well-known entity where especially you'll see it in young people uh, long periods of binge drinking can actually lead to arrhythmias and hearts that are otherwise healthy. Probably the most common presenting rhythm would be AFib with RVR. If you see a young patient with a rhythm that you're used to seeing in like a 65 year old, you might ask them if they've been binge drinking lately. And um, sometimes the answer will surprise you. Good news is that typically this resolves on its own and it doesn't need medication and it doesn't need ablation. It just needs time for that body to restore the balance. The problem is that over time, if this heart is chronically exposed to large levels of alcohol, it causes pathological changes in the shape and the function of the heart. And one of the most common things associated with alcohol use in terms of cardiology is dilated cardiomyopathy. Chronic alcohol use over time can make the heart get bigger, can make it reshape. And if you look at this heart on the left, that's a big, giant, floppy heart that has a hard time squeezing efficiently to provide the blood flow needs of the body. Whereas if you look at the normal heart over on the right, that's what it should look like. So this is a picture of dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a very well-known complication of chronic alcohol abuse. Also important to recognize is alcohol effects. We talked about what happens in the liver to alcohol metabolism, and there's too many fatty acids being made. Well, as a consequence of that, one of those is that the body starts to make estrogen, 
and actually decrease testosterone levels. So alcohol is directly toxic to testicular cells, which can lead to testicular atrophy, low testosterone, low sperm counts. But not only that, it increases estrogen, so it encourages breast development and maybe some mood swings, depression, fatigue, decreased muscle mass, central obesity. All of these things can be directly relinked to hormones that are affected by chronic alcohol abuse. And lastly, the brain, probably most importantly, over time, alcohol abuse absolutely affects the cellular function in the brain. And so this can result in difficulty walking. The name for the, the medical name for that is ataxia or off balance. It can lead to double or blurry vision. It can lead to confusion and impaired short-term memory. These are all areas of the brain that have been very well studied in humans that show that they're particularly susceptible to chronic alcohol abuse. And this is what it, where the arrows are here is what it would look like on an MRI. The medical name for that is Wernicke's encephalopathy, and it does have a lot to do, again, with vitamin deficiencies. This one is specifically related to vitamin B1, it's thiamine, and if you look at, this is a, actually, I think it was a female, about 65 years old. Here is her brain when she came into the emergency room and couldn't walk and had double vision and was very confused and struggling with her memory. They gave her B1 or thiamine in the hospital when she got admitted and look what happened. Her brain got better. Not completely better. She still has some like white spots there, but you can see that there's a marked difference between A and C and that is just with um, vitamin administration. So malnutrition is absolutely, I think it gets overlooked a lot in the medical community, but it's absolutely important. And here's some more chronic effects of alcohol in the brain. B1 isn't gonna fix everything. Over time, brain cells, just like liver cells, just like pancreas cells, they start to die. And so this was unfortunately a 43-year-old al alcoholic. If you compare that to a normal 43-year-old brain that's nice and full and lots of gray and white matter, here's one where it's just atrophied and it looks like the brain of a 90-year-old. And if you think about that brain shrinking, if you look at this right here, see how there's a lot of room if you were to fall and that person was to fall and to hit their head, that brain would kind of rattle, right? It has lots of room to float and to hit against the sides, right? Well, what happens when our alcoholics fall who have some brain atrophy going on is that they can tear the little tiny veins that are holding their brain to the skull. Those are called bridging veins. And when those bridging veins tear, after an alcoholic falls because their balance and their coordination is affected, right? So is their vision, maybe so is their night vision with their vitamin A deficiency. They're very prone to hitting their head, which means that they're very prone to bleeding and they tend to have very highly increased risk for subdural hemorrhage. And that's why, because of the brain atrophy and everything else going on, they can tear the vessels in their brain. Not only that, but chronic alcohol use has been shown to cause insomnia and more sleep disorders. Some people say that they drink to help them sleep, but it has actually been shown to worsen sleep apnea over time, and it absolutely interferes with the sleep cycle. So that by the time people are getting to the REM sleep, the really deep sleep that your body needs to regenerate, the alcohol has worn off, and it actually interferes with that, that deep restorative sleep that um, people need. And it's been shown to worsen depression as well. So people with alcohol dependence are 3.7 times more likely to have a depressive disorder. And some people argue that they're using alcohol to treat their depression, but they're absolutely linked together. So I know this whole talk has been in the context of patients, but I also realize that a lot of people out there drink alcohol pretty regularly. I'd be a bad doctor if I didn't bring this up now and talk about this with us as providers as well. I know that alcohol abuse is a large problem in our community as a whole. We know as a state that we're twice as high than the national average, and that affects everybody. It affects physicians, it affects nurses, and it affects first responders. And so I would just encourage you guys to take a minute while you're listening to this and just do a little bit of introspection. Maybe ask yourself those cage questions and really think about it. And if you find yourself ask, 
answering yes to any of those, there are a lot of resources out there that are available for help. So City of Albuquerque has an employee assistance program. I know that the union has a member assistance program. There's an abundance of resources that are ready and willing to help if people just want to reach out. So, and as always, if you do have questions or concerns, you can talk to the 7-8 as well.